Europe's largest city recovers from plague and fire, the son of a war hero sits in a jail cell. Held captive in the Tower of London, William Penn dares to challenge the Church of England. He's a young radical. He's the son of an admiral, a gentleman, a theologian, a man of reason. He's all these things, sometimes at the same time. He's enraptured with Quaker ideas about human equality, and this gets him into some serious trouble. The only portrait we have of him, he's wearing armor. Good Quaker isn't supposed to do a thing like that. In time, the young rebel will make a city, and his city will be the seed of a nation. For much of the 1600s, the English live in fear of constant warfare and disease. Both traumas mark young William Penn. From childhood, he wears a wig to hide the scars of smallpox. His father, Admiral Penn, is an ally of King Charles II. His son didn't join the Anglican Church and be a good boy. His father was very unhappy with his son's nonconformity. He's an outsider in his own home and an outsider in the larger English establishment. He takes up with other people who think as he does. This cadre of avant-garde thinkers call themselves Philadelphians and gives him a sense that he's not crazy. Angered by his son's disobedience, Admiral Penn sends William on a tour of France and Italy. William is not impressed. He recoils at the misery and suffering surrounding the opulent palaces, the frivolous playground of his own social class. He's seen London, which burned in 1666. He's seen Paris and the extraordinary inequality of wealth, the salaciousness of the court, and the, the ridiculousness of pretension, and all those things rung untrue to him and wrong to him. He imagines what he can do to mend the world. He sees plainly dressed preachers roaming the countryside, railing against war and material wealth. Inspired, William joins their fledgling movement, the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers. Together, they boldly challenge the Church of England and face a violent backlash from the British government. He's converted. He's preaching in the streets, and pretty soon he finds himself in jail for his association with these rabble-rousers. William Penn writes a number of what are called subversive tracts, criticizing long-standing religion. He's testing the limits of society. Trial by jury, no established church, a government of laws, not men. He tells the king he will not retract at all, even if the prison is his grave. William's commitment eventually impresses even his father. Near death, Admiral Penn buys his son's release from jail and petitions James, the Duke of York, to shield William from England's laws of religious persecution. The king owed a huge debt to William Penn's father for services to the crown during the English-Dutch War. Charles II is not able to square the debt with Admiral Penn before, unfortunately, Admiral Penn passes away. So the debt has passed to William Penn. The king chooses to repay the debt, not with money, but with land. He offers Penn a colony in North America, 45,000 square miles on the west side of the Delaware River in the New World. The English settlements were poorly protected from the French to the north or the Spanish to the west. When William Penn volunteers his services as a colony creator, what the king hears him saying is, I am volunteering to create a buffer zone and I will populate it with Quakers. William Penn had a dream, he called it a holy experiment. He was talking about founding a government the like of which didn't exist anywhere. At age 36, Penn has secured a canvas for his utopian dream. He wants to call it Sylvania, 
Latin for woods. But the king insists upon naming the colony for William's father, Admiral Penn. The rebellious young Quaker is now one of the largest landholders in the British Empire, the absolute proprietor of Pennsylvania. He arrives in his new territory on October 29th, 1682. Lots of people came on those boats and they said, we're gonna establish a utopia. Most of them didn't have the faintest idea what was necessary to have a functioning and successful city. William Penn did. It is a clear and just thing, and my God, who has given it me through many difficulties, will, I believe, bless and make it the seed of a nation. William Penn, 1681. Penn brings a vision for his capital, an enormous 10,000-acre city concentrated along the Delaware River. But there is not enough open land for such a large city. Penn isn't the first to get here. There were Swedes here, Dutch, Finns, Native Americans. There is a robust population already here. It was very difficult to figure out where to put the city and what that city would be like. Penn sends Thomas Holm, an experienced surveyor, to walk across the woods and meadows marking future streets with his own steps. Holm and Penn envision a new type of city, spacious enough to guard against the squalor of European capitals. They negotiate with Swedish farmers to buy their land. Penn had experienced both the Great Fire of London and the plague. His view was that if the city was built with enough green space, that a fire couldn't decimate it. Holmes' plan transforms Penn's sprawling idea into a distinctive town of square blocks and wide streets. There would be no dark alleyways, as in London or other European cities, where vice might flourish in the shadows. Oh, no. Thomas Holmes comes up with an orderly grid pattern. There'll be the center square where City Hall is now. The city will go from river to river, from the Delaware to the Schuylkill. And the grid becomes the pattern for American urban development up to the present day. The principle of order, which is what Quakers were really about, is what resonates most. When that map went back to London, people were moved by it. Europe was in disorder, and wars and famine, overpopulation, all of these were push factors to get people to leave. Penn names his city Philadelphia. He believes it will be a place that aspires to the Quaker ideal of brotherly love. Brotherly love has its roots in the concept of liberty of conscience. What you believe is your business. This is something altogether new in Western history. This God-intoxicated man sees Pennsylvania as a chance to create Philadelphia, the New Jerusalem. On the other hand, it's also a place for Penn to make lots of money. In advertisements, Penn entices buyers with a three-part land deal. Waterfront property in the city, parcels in the Liberty Lands north of town, and country farms in places like the Welsh Tract in Marionshire and Erdenheim in Springfield. He's saying, my city is going to have its own bank account, the agricultural hinterland. We're going to be not just a colonial extraction port, we're going to be a city. Word of mouth traveled back across the ocean that the founders of the colony had in their minds the best interests of the colonists. Pennsylvania, by what you call the Delaware River today, is the historic homeland of the Lenape people. When William Penn arrived, Native Americans had already been dealing with Europeans on some level for over 100 years. But the scale was radically different. For the Lenape, this represented a greater threat because a larger group of people would require more land. Penn and his agents seek out Lenape chiefs in late 1682. They claim to want a peaceful partnership. William Penn learned our language 
and sought to follow our ceremonies when meeting with us. Even though he had the backing of a great force, the British Empire, he sat with our leaders and worked out an understanding where the intention was that we would live together in peace in Philadelphia. I desire to enjoy the land with your love and consent, that we may always live together as neighbors and friends, not devour and destroy one another, but live soberly and kindly together in the world. The Lenape had the potential to disrupt his colony, to make settlement there unappealing to people who Penn was recruiting from Europe. When Penn was setting up the city, he explicitly said, I don't want garrisons and I don't want walls. By creating friendly mutuality with the Lenape, William Penn spares the colony and the city the cost of building a defensive perimeter. The things that Boston, New York, Virginia have to do, Philadelphia does not have to do. Penn buys land from the Lenape in a deal that has come to be known as Penn's Treaty. That treaty is the subject of a lot of historical myth-making. It's painted long after Penn is dead by Benjamin West. It gets reproduced on china patterns, dish towels, beer mugs, it's everywhere. It represents the road not taken for the rest of America. As Americans are marching west and decimating Native American populations, Americans look back at Penn and say, could it have been different? The Lenape had expectations that this was the dawn of a new era of peace and that turned out to not be true fairly quickly thereafter. As hundreds of buildings suddenly appear in what had always been Lenape Woods, the chief, Ninichikin, suspects that Penn has cheated him. He tells an English settler, William Penn shall be my brother no more. When you've convinced yourself that you are good, it baffles the daylights out of you. Why, people? Balk. William Penn is a man who wants to exercise control, but control is constantly, constantly eluding him. Just two years after Penn begins his ambitious experiment, Lord Baltimore of Maryland claims he owns portions of Pennsylvania, forcing Penn to return to England to defend his right to the land. He joins the inner circle of his old ally, the Duke of York, now King James II. In the court of the king, Penn becomes the strong advocate of religious toleration. There's no reason to come back to small little Philadelphia if you can help govern England. Penn was 3,000 miles away, so whether he likes it or not, his own settlers make a hash of what he expected things to be. They didn't spread evenly across the landscape between the Delaware and Schuylkill Rivers. No, what they did is they crowded close to the Delaware River. They cut little alleyways into the alleyways and created a very different kind of world than the one that Penn imagined. The capital city comes to life as the streets crowd with carpenters and merchants, brewers and brickmakers. There was an early investor in that colony, George Guest, who was given land to create a brickyard, and it lasts for a while but he dies. Guest's widow, Alice, has to pick up the pieces. She appeals to the merchants and craftsmen along the river. The growing city needs places for people to come together and exchange information and ideas. Alice Guest will open a tavern, the Crooked Billet. Her tavern becomes part of the fabric and the life of William Penn's capital city, who is all centered around the life of the river and she becomes a rather wealthy woman, one of the first sort of self-made female entrepreneurs in Philadelphia. By 1693, there are 20 taverns in Philadelphia. Some of them operate illegally in makeshift caves along the banks of the Delaware, magnets for drunkenness and vice. Instead of this being a cooperative, inward-looking community, obedient, to the inner light. Instead, you get a lot of foreigners, Germans, Mennonites, Schwenkfelders, 
People who haven't got the slightest interest in Quakerism and who don't give a wet slap for William Penn's principles. This was a major port and lots of business came through the city of Philadelphia. That included China, gold, silver, and of course, the dreaded human being. In 1684, less than two years after the founding of Philadelphia, 150 enslaved Africans arrived to be sold at auction. Many people look at Philadelphia and they think of freedom. They think of liberty. The Quakers were some of the biggest financers of the slave trade. William Penn owned slaves. Is it a question of simply being a man of his times? Does that spiritual equality not embrace everyone? Do the civil liberties that he's working towards not embrace them all? These questions haunt the holy experiment. By 1693, there are hundreds of slaves in Philadelphia. They socialize in the city's public squares. But that year, the governing committee issues an order. Any slave found in public without the master's permission will be publicly whipped with 39 lashes. Over time, issues of wealth, greed, often displaced the founding principles of sharing, of tolerance, and of communal engagement. The Quakers come to make money, and slavery goes right along with it. And eventually, you have to decide whether or not money is more important than ethical purity. While William Penn remains absent from his colony, Francis Daniel Pastorius, the founder of Germantown, assumes the moral authority. When Pastorius gets here, he wonders, what are these Quakers doing? These are Quakers who are supposed to be imagining that all human beings are equal, and yet they're holding slaves? This doesn't make any sense. Pastorius sees hypocrisy in Quaker slaveholders. He insists, above all else, that slavery is evil. Pastorius says to Philadelphia friends, in Germany we don't make slaves of people you do here and you make slaves of people on the basis of race. That's not a Christian thing to do. He recruits fellow German immigrants to sign the Germantown Quaker Petition Against Slavery, the first abolitionist document in North America. It's a Quaker city, Philadelphia, certainly but it opens the doors for religious freedom that now is enjoyed throughout the country. What Penn did was to create the most diverse city in the colonies. Penn's absolute authority protects religious dissidents from English law, turning Philadelphia into a haven for seekers and outcasts. Among the most radical of the new arrivals is Johannes Kelpius, a mystic philosopher from Transylvania. Kelpius is one of the early benefactors of William Penn's great experiment for religious freedom. He and his Society of the Woman in the Wilderness came to the Wissahickon to ride out the end of days. Kelpius and his flock build caves in the woods around Germantown and proclaim that the world will end in 1694, a lifestyle that would be heretical in any other colony. Kelpius believed that bringing together a community of very devout, pious, celibate, and even vegetarian in some cases, would hasten the pace at which the end of time would come. They built the first observatory in North America on the roof of their tabernacle, and they looked at the stars every night to read the signs of the coming of the Lord. As Kelpius and his followers hide from society, a fiery evangelist named George Keith attacks it. Like Pastorius, Keith sees the Quaker merchants around him as morally adrift and greedy. He will not keep his mouth shut. At one point, it turns to physical violence, and the Keithians try to take over. 
a Quaker meeting house. It's barred against them, padlocked, and they come with axes, and they beat down the doors, trample inside. This divides Philadelphia society for the next 20 years, and some of the Keithian advocates will later end up members of Christ Church, Anglican, or Baptist, or Mennonite. The balance of power tips away from a Quaker colony. After a 15-year absence, Penn returns to Philadelphia in 1699 with his wife, Hannah Callowhill Penn. But they find a city stunningly transformed and the founder's authority compromised. Pennsylvania bolts away from the leash on which William Penn wants to keep it and develops in its own fashion. We are looking at a lawless city. We had the highest incarceration rate of any American colonial city, higher than Boston, higher than New York. They couldn't believe the kind of deviant behavior they saw in the streets. In 1701, Philadelphia's assembly protests Penn's absolute control. He seeks a compromise and drafts a charter of privileges, establishing the first democratically elected legislature in North America. He signs this charter just as he sails away, never to return. What that charter sets out is a set of basic rights of citizenship. Thomas Jefferson famously wrote that William Penn was the greatest lawgiver that the world had ever seen. Back in England, a series of strokes leaves Penn debilitated. Hannah Penn will take over the Pennsylvania government and run the colony for 13 years. When disaster struck one after the other, the deaths, court cases, a stroke, there wasn't anyone else to take over except Hannah. She'd been raised in a business household. She had some sense of executive skill that William Penn never really had. It was no small satisfaction to me in seeing the people prosper and growing up to a flourishing country, blessed with liberty, ease, and plenty. But alas, the many combats I have engaged in, the great pains and incredible expense, sink me into sorrow. William Penn was, in a sense, a madman. He had risked everything spend time in jail. This is a man who, at certain times of his life, could walk into the royal court of England. And he was willing to risk all of it to create a place that would represent the Quaker ideals in the world. Who founded New York City? Who founded Boston or Chicago? The answer is, I don't know. Who, you know nobody cares. That's the point. But this is still William Penn's town, and he sits up there, and we walk around literally in his shadow. I really don't think that there are any other cities that identify with their founder to such an extent that they would put a much larger-than-life statue of him atop their great municipal building. It's kind of funny, and it's kind of perfect. It's so Philadelphian. He names his city for that future that he envisions, which both inspires and dogs Philadelphia throughout its history. It becomes a standard to shoot for, it becomes an identity, and it becomes a yardstick against which the city's inevitable shortcomings are consistently measured. It doesn't just mean city of brotherly love. Nobody knew during Penn's lifetime that religious freedom would come to be the norm. Nobody knew in Penn's lifetime that democracy would come to be the norm. Philadelphia means a better world. When Penn dies in 1718, Philadelphia is the fastest growing city in North America. His holy experiment has nearly bankrupted him, yet he has set an extraordinary place in motion.